Hello again and welcome to another Warhammer 40k Imperial Guard Tactics video. Now before we get into today's video I would like to say a big thank you to Sean for sending in some awesome pictures of his Destroyer 441st. Absolutely love the red in this paint scheme. It's so deep and just crisp. I just love it. I can't get enough of it and with the snow bases do they know it's Christmas? Yes, they bloody do, because these Restorians look absolutely fantastic. And I especially love the little hats that you've put on the Ogrins that make them look like Restorians. Absolutely fantastic. I love putting little hats on my Ogrins as well. Looks really, really cool. So thank you for sending these pictures in, Sean. You've done the Emperor proud with these beautiful boys. If anyone else has got any cool pictures they want me to use in my videos, please post them on my Facebook page, or you can email them to me at morningglorytv at gmail.com. Without further ado, let's crack on with today's video. So today, guys, I want to try and tackle one of the all-time biggest questions that plagues 40k to this day. This is a question that has been around since the dawn of probably video gaming, war gaming, all sorts of gaming. And so this video isn't just going to be applying to Imperial Guard, but it obviously will be Guard themed because that's what we're all about. But you'll be able to take this video and apply it to almost any 40k faction out there. And hopefully you'll find it useful. All right, Modern Glory, stop teasing us. What's this big question? Is, it, is the answer 42? What is the meaning of life? All this kind of stuff. Well, basically, guys, I'm going to try and just break down which is better, to have a horde of weaker models or a small elite fighting force. Now, this question has been around for a long time, and the reason it's been around for a long time is because it's very difficult to answer. And also, it's very, very subjective. And I would argue, I'm going to give you the answer straight away at the beginning now, I would argue that the answer is a bit of a cop-out, but it is, it depends. It depends on many, many factors. But what I'm going to do today, guys, rather than people just clicking off and going, oh, well, he's not going to give us an answer then, what a knobhead, and like leave, I'm going to go through and give a quick summary of the advantages and disadvantages of both kinds of army. And so what you'll be able to do when you get to the end of this video, you'll be able to listen to it, you'll be able to feel it, and by the end, you'll be able to go, I know which one is better for me. I know which one I prefer. And so rather than trying to give an answer, which quite frankly could be wrong, and you'll see why it could be wrong, because like I said, it depends. At the very least, you'll be able to go away from this and know hopefully what style of army is right for you, a horde army or an elite army. So without further ado, that's the intro, guys. Let's jump straight into this. Now, the first thing that I want to talk about is style and feel of armies, right? Now, there is great advantages and disadvantages to all types of armies, and that's tactical advantages and there's rules and all sorts of things you can take into account. But at the end of the day, being able to decide which is better, and especially which is better for you as a player, will come down to what kind of player you are and what style of army you think you're going to enjoy the most. So, for example, horde armies look, generally speaking, really impressive on the battlefield. One of the greatest compliments that Imperial Guard armies will consistently get when they go to the table, when they go to the tournament, isn't how good the army is, it isn't how competitive the army is, but how it feels and looks like a real army, how it looks like a proper fighting force. And that is because Guard often uses a lot of models, and a lot of those models look quite cool. They're kind of realistic as well. And so when it comes to deciding what's better, a horde army or a elite army, the first thing you've got to ask yourself as a player is what are you going to enjoy the most? Are you going to enjoy seeing hordes of conscripts and tanks charging across the battlefield, just getting mown down by the hundreds, but eventually you'll break through, you'll take that territory, and you really get to embrace that sort of World War One, that Napoleonic style vibe. You know, is that the style of army that you want to go for? Or does that sound a bit, well, A, a bit dark, because, you know, loads of models are going to be dying, and these do represent real men on the battlefield and all that kind of stuff. Or, and do you not like the idea of just, you know, waves of concepts getting thrown down? I mean, at the end of the day, waves of conscripts getting mown down is not a good military tactic. I mean, as much as the tactical imperialists might tell us it is, you know, modern militaries have definitely progressed beyond that. And so what you might want to ask yourself is, I want a guard army, or I want a marine army, or I want a custodian army, whatever it is, but I don't want to have essentially a big horde of models. I want to have an elite 
strike force. And what I find cool and what I find effective and what I find interesting is having an elite fighting force, not the hordes of henchmen and NPCs, but having that elite strike group that, you know, every one of my men is worth 10 of their men. And it's just, that's the way I want to play my army. And I want to see my opponent throwing waves of, you know, NPCs at me, waves of conscripts at me. And I bash them all away and I still achieve my objective despite the fact that I was outnumbered and maybe even outgunned at times. Which one of those two armies, you know, two styles, it sounds best for you is really the one you should pick. Now you might be saying, "One growth morning." This doesn't seem like a tactics video. We're talking about style, we're talking about feel, and all this kind of stuff. Well, it's really important to get this first bit right because if you are you, you will know your playstyle. You will know your preference. You know that's not something I can tell you, but you need to make sure that you're going down the right route for you. If you're the kind of person that, let's say, you play video games and you're coming over to, to the tabletop. If you're the kind of person that likes to have always got you know the best units in your video games, always has the best upgrades, the best armor, all that kind of stuff, and then you suddenly transition over to using a horde of guys, you're not playing the way that naturally comes to you. You're almost having to learn a whole new way of playing. And so you're not going to make as good decisions. You're not going to be able to do things based on gut instinct and just in innate knowledge. You're going to have to try and actually almost learn stuff that doesn't come naturally to you. And you'll be fighting your own nature. And that is a recipe for disaster. There's an age old story that goes around pretty much every Warhammer 40k club you're ever going to come across. Of a guy that has an army that isn't the best or anything like that. But he's just been playing the game for so long that he's like actually almost unbeatable. He might literally have an army of like third or second edition Ultramarines and he's not got a single primary unit. He's barely upgraded it. He's just bought what he has to buy to stay legal and he just smashed everyone he comes across. And some of these stories are exaggerated, but there is a grain of truth in them. The reason why that guy knows his art, it does so well, and the reason why you'll always have those long beards that do really, really well and they always have a, a spot reserved for them on team tournaments is because they know what they like and they're so well practiced at it, and they're so well in tune with their army because they've just listened to that aspect of it, that they do much better than you would think if you put their army list on paper and showed it to like a form who just got that's a trash army, right? So it might seem wishy-washy, it might seem a bit vague, but when it comes to knowing what is the best kind of army, the real answer, one of the biggest answers, one of the biggest factors is, what is the best kind of army? For you, do you like hordes or do you like elite strike forces? So that's kind of the more vague sort of concept. That's that's kind of the more diff in untangible. Now let's get a little bit more drilled down. Let's start talking about actual tactics and actual rules and considerations that are going to decide whether horde armies or elite armies are better. So aside from the player. There is one other massive factor that's going to influence whether Horde armies or Elite armies are good. And when we're talking about 40k, we're going to be talking about the edition that you're playing in. Because at the end of the day, you might have a preferred playstyle and that will help you a long way when it comes to learning your army and getting good with your army. But unfortunately, 40k is not balanced. And there will be times, there will be editions when certain army styles are just flat out better than others. And so an example of this is if you look at like 8th edition versus 9th edition. Two very similar editions when it comes to the rules and the way the units are built and the data slates and all that kind of stuff. But two totally different editions when it comes to what kind of armies are most effective. 8th edition, especially at the beginning, was very much the addition of hordes. You know, you had the Boogeyman army, which was hundreds of conscripts backed up by commissars that swept all before it. And there were so many memes made about guard about how they were horrible to play against. And, you know, oh, you know, show us your fun faction, but not you sort of pointing at the guard and all that kind of stuff. And so back in 8th edition, hordes were the way to go. And the reason why that was the case was because of the way the objectives and the missions and everything worked. And there weren't like cumulative objectives really or anything like that. It was a case of holding the most by the end. It was quite traditional 40K, how many editions have been. And so the fact that the way 8th edition worked and the way the AP system had changed and all this kind of stuff meant that hordes 
were the way to play and that guard were really really strong at the beginning of eighth edition it's it's hard to imagine now if you're coming across this video on the day of recording you know sort of 13th of, uh, of, of june 2022 but it's hard to imagine now but guard were once the top tier faction and that was because we were a shooty horde army and the reason we and we were unbreakable thanks to conscripts and so and commissars and so what used to happen is we would cover huge amounts of the board we would be able to move and move around we have to take all the objectives and what was important in that edition wasn't so much force concentration but was combat width and we've talked about this concept before concentration versus combat width but it's probably worth me doing another video on it at some point and so force combat width was important in eighth edition now we come over to ninth edition and it's a totally different ball game you know it's a totally different ball game you have got a situation now where objectives are cumulative where um, secondary objectives are apparently specifically tailored against armies that like to field large amounts of units you've got thin the ranks you've got or whatever it's called these days you've got uh, ground them down you've got um, bring it down you know all of these things that can be stacked up against us that basically mean if you take lots of tanks because you can take whole tanks as guard, you're screwed. You take all the infantry, you're screwed. So, ninth edition is certainly not the edition for hordes. So, if you wanted an answer right now, what is better in ninth edition? I would say elite armies are better than horde armies right now in ninth edition. If you'd asked this question of me three years ago, two years ago, I would have said hordes are better than elites. And so, this is kind of one of the reasons why this question will never truly be answered. But if you want an answer sort of like right now in the moment, it's because additions wax and wane, things change. You know, unit types and army types change all the time. And that's more than likely by design by Games Workshop to help keep things fresh and to keep people wanting to buy new models and all that kind of good stuff. I mean, that business at the end of the day, that's what they want to do, right? But right now I would say that elite armies are better. And that's because you can just, you know, force, the boards are smaller, so combat width means less because you know, an army that's elite doesn't have to travel as far now and all this kind of other stuff so right now i would say elite armies are better there are some exceptions to this like for example you do have conscript horde armies where if you take 300 plus conscripts you can do great things but you know look at all of the traditional horde armies like green tide is dead you know um apart from like conscript spam and other, other stuff kind of stuff like imp infantry guard is starting to struggle a little bit with the level of lethality that we're finding out there at the moment i mean i lost 200 infantry in one turn at the last tournament i went to that's insane um you know and then you, you know tyranid hordes despite the buffs that termagants have had you're not seeing many people taking them it's all about the big bugs again right so right now ninth edition isn't good for hordes and so right now elite choices are better but 10th edition could come along and it could be totally the opposite it could be hordes are back on the menu again and so that's why it's difficult to ever answer this question truly. But it is something that you want to be able to be aware of. Like at the end of the day, there will be additions when hordes are better and there will be additions when uh, elite units are better. Now, before we wrap up to today's video, I want to just go through a couple of advantages and disadvantages of each kind of army. So we've talked quite high level at the moment. We've talked about general considerations as you as a player. We've talked about... The addition that you might be in, which is a huge thing to talk about, like the whole addition in one go. Let's now break it down. I just want to do some almost rapid fire points on the advantages and disadvantages of force concentration, combat width, the advantages of being elite, the advantage of being uh, a horde army. So first thing to talk about with the advantage of being elites is force concentration. You've heard me mention this a little bit already in the video, but what force concentration means is like, if you can concentrate your army's force, if you're an elite army, then that means that you can, for every point on the battlefield, you can apply more damage, you can apply more force than your opponent can do. You see, let's say you've got, you know, three units of infantry squads versus a unit, you know, a unit of custodies, right? Those three infantry squads might equal similar points to that custodian squad. But they're never going to win a fight against them. You know, five custodians will tear their way through 30 guardsmen every day of the week. And so they should. They're the golden boys. They're the emperor's finest warriors. 
but they're an equal points value roughly. So how does that work? I mean, surely they should be equal, right? Well, no, because the custodies have the advantage of the fact that they have a lot more firepower in a smaller package and they can win pretty much any one-on-one -on -one fight that you're going to throw them against. So that's the advantage of force concentration. The disadvantage is, and this is where combat width gets a huge advantage, is that those custodies can only be in so many places at once. They are one unit, whereas the three garrison squads are three units. That one unit of custodies, even if it strings out quite heavily, will probably only ever be able to sit on one objective. Those three garrison squads can each sit on an objective. They have much higher board presence. That unit of custodies is relatively slow. I mean, the, every faction has tricks for getting around the board, don't get me wrong. But the guard, the, the, the infantry squads, they can move with move. They can go chimeras, they can go in Valkyries, they can go underground, they can go above ground. They can do all sorts of things. The point is, is that they have not got individual strength, but they have great force width. And so really what we call combat width, they can cover more areas of the board. They can be in more places at once. You know, if you were to play literally a game of one unit of custodians versus three units of guard, you the custodians might lose that game every single time because the guard could hide out of line of sight. They could just refuse to engage the custodians and they could just accumulatively build up loads of primary points and just deny the custodian secondary points if you're thinking about like, you know, terrain and all that kind of stuff. So... That's the advantage of combat width, is that you do a lot of damage and you're going to win the fights and you're going to smash your opponent. But the advantage of, of sort of being more hoardy and being more combat width is that you can play what's called the objective game better. And one of the key things that a lot of horde armies will do is they will lose the fight, but they'll win on points. That's often what you tend to find. So you'll hear a lot of guard players say, oh, I managed to finally get myself to turn five and I just managed to squeak a victory. I'd been almost tabled, but I had been able to just keep ahead of the points long enough that when it got to the end of the game, I was ahead on points and I won. Okay, and that is a really, really, that's almost the perfect example of combat width versus uh, force concentration. The guy that had the combat width lost the fight he didn't win, like, you know, he, he, you know, his opponent maybe had a thousand points left and he had maybe 200, 300 points left. But he won on points and he won the game despite the fact that he lost way more than his opponent. And so the force concentration guys had won the fight and the force width guys, the combat width guys, had won the mission. It's that classic saying, you may have won the battle but lost the war. But we'll leave the video there for now. I think we've covered some great general principles and a couple of specific ones about force concentration, about elite versus horde armies and all that good stuff. And for many of you, you'll be very familiar with these concepts, but hopefully it's still given you a few things to think about. And what I would highly encourage anyone that is very familiar with this kind of idea of force concentration, elites and hordes and that kind of stuff, and you think I've missed anything, I think there's a great point that you can add to the video, Put it down in the comment section below. There's always so much great information down in that comment section. If you're a newer player or a person who stumbled across this video for the first time, I highly recommend you check out the comment section. There's a fantastic community around here at the Morning Glory channel. And a lot of the best bits of these videos aren't even in the videos. They're in the comment section down below. Um, so I hope you have enjoyed today's video. If you have, of course, please consider giving it a like, subscribe, comment, all that good stuff, all that interactivity, boost the algorithm. But if you've really enjoyed today's video, please consider becoming a channel member or a Patreon supporter. It's thanks to my channel members and Patreon supporters that this channel has been able to go from strength to strength. And we're now looking at potentially full-time Mordian glory going forward, which would be absolutely fantastic, game-changing, life-changing even. So massive thank you to those people that are already channel members. Massive thank you to those people that are paid supporters you guys know how much i appreciate you but i like to make a big deal out of it because i just love my patron supporters and i love my channel members before we end the video i do want to make a special effort and just say a huge personal thank you to some of our top tier patreon supporters i want to say thank you to august varney i want to say thank you 
to John Stubbs for being Lord Generals and subscribing at the top tier of Morning Glory Patreon. You guys are absolutely fantastic and your generosity genuinely blows me away. So massive thank you to you guys. I also want to say a special thank you to those people who have signed up at the Commissar level. That's Diesel Fox, Shooter McGavin and Swordfish Thumbs. You guys have also truly made it possible for me to even consider the idea of full-time Morgan Glory. So massive thank you. And I just hope you know how much I truly appreciate you. So thank you for watching. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. And of course, I'll see you guys next time.